Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's very good to see you all. I wondered whether, before we start, whether we could just um, have a, a minute silence, please, for in solidarity with our friends in Ukraine. If you're if you're willing and able, I think it would be appropriate on today of all days for us to do that. So, um, if you'd like to join me briefly, as I say, in a moment, silence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it gives me a very, well, for those who don't know me, I should begin by introducing myself, I suppose. Um, my name is John Oldfield and I'm a, a former director of the Wilberforce Institute, the immediate uh, predecessor to uh, Trevor. Um, it is my very great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, I've known Bruce now for over 40 years. Uh, since we were graduate students at the University of Virginia. And I'm very pleased to say that we have been close friends ever since. In fact, Bruce is one of my very closest friends and a very trusted and valued colleague. Um, Bruce, uh, after Virginia and doing his thesis, PhD thesis at Virginia, went on to become what in the United States is a recognized field. Uh, as a public historian, first uh, with the US House of Representatives and subsequently as head of the Federal Judicial Center, which is the education and research agency of the U US Federal Court, meaning very much the US Supreme Court. Uh, and he had a very distinguished career as, as I say, as head of that and leading its educational and research programs. But Bruce, I think you will probably agree with this, as his first lo love has always been colonial history and the history of what is often referred to as the early National Republic or the early Republic. His first book um, was on uh, was called The Planters Republic, which was for, which was on uh, the search for economic independence in revolutionary Virginia <clears throat> and most recently he's published this we have multiple copies of this book miraculously um but here this the washington at the plow the founding farmer not founding father but founding farmer and the question of slavery published by harvard university press and this has been widely uh, reviewed including in the washington post um, um extremely nuanced and thoughtful reinterpretation of Washington and the whole question of slavery, which I think also, and one of its great virtues, is it places Washington in a transatlantic context. In fact, Bruce uh, has become over the years not only a transatlantic historian, but also a British historian who puts me to shame um, many, many times as we travel around the country looking at country estates and uh, various things. He knows far more than I do. Um, Without further ado, Bruce, I'd like you to speak to us this evening on the title of the book, Washington at the Plough, the Founding Farmer and the Question of Slavery. Thank you very much. Um, let me just briefly move this on, Bruce, because I think that, I, that slide was supposed to accompany what I've just <laughs> said, but you'll forgive me. Anyway, thank you, Bruce. Great to see you. Thank you so long from the... Um, thank you so much, John, and, and thank you all for coming out today. And those of you who are watching online, uh, I'm so pleased to be here. I heard about the World Force Institute and Hull for so many years while John was living here and working here that I'm delighted to finally be here and to um, talk about um, talk about this book. Um, let's just start there. Um, a, a British visitor to um, the Mount Vernon estate in 1785 um, wrote back to friends in, in London and said that he reported that Washington's greatest pride following the Revolutionary War was to be considered the first farmer of America. Um, Washington's remembered for so many firsts, but um, the whole idea of him as the first farmer of America is one that really has been lost to the memory of, of Washington. And it was something that I wanted to recover of why uh, Washington would have considered this um, such an important accolade, particularly after having just 
um, resigned his commission from the Continental Army after having just secured um, independence um, after the Revolutionary War. Um, and at, at that point, um, th like throughout most of Washington's life, he, he um, well, he thought that, that agriculture would be one of the most important foundations of um, respectability for the new nation uh, among community of nations in the Atlantic world. He thought that a particular kind of agriculture would be the foundation of commercial prosperity. He very much envisioned the nation as being primarily um, uh, agricultural. Um, and really, at, at every stage in his life, he um, thought that the innovations that he undertook at his own estate um, would at least point the direction to um, the, the growth of, of the economy, first of colonial Virginia and then of, of the um, new United States. He, he, he considered his farming almost a kind of civic service, part of of the public leadership he offered. But the farming also offers um, a, a view of an unfamiliar side of, of what is probably of who is probably the most familiar of Americans. Um, Washington spent more time as a farmer at his estate than he spent as either a military commander or as president. Um, he considered farming the activity best suited to his disposition. He said it was more rewarding than any string of military victories could be. Um, and it also is um, um, life as a farmer re reveals a private side that, it, that most people don't know about Washington. It's barely discernible in his public and his military life. I mean, he was someone who was deeply connected to the natural world had an almost intuitive ability to read a landscape uh, and certainly to read um, the growth of plants. Um, he was intellectually curious. Um, he was a, a, a very committed and bold experimenter as a farmer. And he also was a very active participant in a transatlantic community and transatlantic communications of self-consciously enlightened landowners who were trying to exchange uh, both agricultural knowledge and the results of, of scientific experiment. Um, Washington had, had been involved in farming at some level throughout his whole life. His, his probably earliest vivid memories of farming would have been um, seeing his mother who um, ran the family farm after his father died when, when Washington was just 11. His mother um, directed the labor of up to 20 enslaved laborers who produced tobacco on that farm. Um, but Washington began his own life uh, uh, farming at Mount Vernon in, in earnest um, in 1759 after his marriage to Martha Custis just after his resignation from um, his position as a colonel in the Virginia Regiment, the unit in which he had fought during the Seven Years' War. Um, but having failed in his um, ambition to gain a commission as an officer in the British Army, uh, Washington returns um, from military service determined to achieve a different kind of British defined success. And that was success as, as a landowner dedicated to agricultural improvement and experiment. And he modeled his efforts um, on, the, on those of um, the self-professed gentlemen farmers um, who had in recent years completely transformed um, agriculture in Great Britain. But unlike those, um, uh, improving landowners in Great Britain, Washington would pursue the same kinds of experiments, same kind of innovations, while increasing his reliance on um, a system of enslaved labor that had developed um, to support a tobacco economy that he was hoping to displace. Um, and it's those parallel objectives, the dedication to the practices of um, improved British agriculture and the adaptation of enslaved labor to new kinds of farming that really defined Washington's life as a farmer for over 40 years. <clears throat> and the story of Washington's life as a farmer is the story of Washington as an enslaver. Um, he, um, throughout his life, he was almost completely reliant on enslaved agricultural labor. Um, he once wrote a friend um, that he didn't like uh, to even think about, let alone talk about slavery. Um, and in fact, he left a very scant um, a record of his attitudes toward the institution of slavery. Um, he also very self-consciously um, controls that record and um, uh, deliberately created silences in his correspondences that make it very difficult to recreate much about his attitudes toward um, slavery. But the fact is um, that he thought about slavery all the time. 
And um, he left a very rich documentary record about it, but it was as a manager of agricultural labor. And I'll just show you this as an example. This is a document that had, had actually not been, it, it, people knew it existed, but it, it only um, came into public um, view about seven or eight years ago when the Mount Vernon bought it for their library. And it was a, this goes on for four pages, and it's Washington's very in his famous round handwriting that's so easy to read. He writes a detailed description of, of 40 enslaved laborers and the work they did, what they were good at and not good at, and it gives you a sense of just how closely he was involved in the direct management and supervision of enslaved labor throughout, throughout his life um, and, and his engagement with um, these individual um, enslaved um, field laborers for the most part. Um, and it's in this kind of record. Mount Vernon is probably the best documented um, estate of the late 18th century Chesapeake because Washington was obsessive about keeping records. And of course, then people were obsessive about keeping Washington's papers. Um, so it, it's probably as detailed a record of, of uh, um, uh, farming and, and uh, the life of the enslaved at any, as any plantation at the time in, in Virginia. And it's that record that I think finally can reveal far more about Washington's attitudes toward the institution and also about his eventual um, decision to emancipate the enslaved people that he owned. Um, um, on his return to Mount Vernon in 1759, Washington wrote to uh, prestigious London tobacco merchants, Robert Carey and Company, um, and he asked that he asked them to select what he called the newest and most improved treatise of agriculture. And he also asked them to send um, a number of titles of agricultural treatises that he knew by name. And over the next few years, this is one of the first books he receives. This is uh, Thomas Hale's Complete Body of Husbandry. It's a four volume set um, that Washington relied on very um, um, uh, closely. It also, I, I put the frontispiece in here too, because so many of these are set in the context of sort of classical allusions to agricultural improvement, associating the improving farmers of Great Britain and, and uh, by extension, people like Washington um, to the great agriculturalists of, of ancient Rome. And over the next few years, Washington relied primarily on his tobacco merchants to send him what were many of the essential titles of, of, um, of British improved farming. He also bought some others in, in Virginia, thus they became available. And as a result, he put together what was probably the most extensive library of these practical treatises um, in, in Virginia, uh, these treatises that documented the practices of the new husbandry. And in these, um, he also uh, gets, this is also from Hale, it's a, a chart of various plows. It's through these publications, um, far more than any contact with other Virginia planters, that Washington learns about both the uh, cultivation techniques and also about the improved material culture of, of, of farming. And he begins to import um, much, many of those improved farming implements, again, through um, his tobacco um, um, merchants. And you can directly trace his use of new plows, his um, um, exper specific experiments, especially with soil um, amendments, um, his planting of new kinds of grasses, um, to within a few months of when he would receive uh, the book uh, in which he'd read about them. Um, none of these books had anything to do with tobacco or corn, the traditional crops of, of colonial Virginia, the foundation of, of the um, wealthiest planters' wealth for much of the um, 18th century. Um, and the very purchase of these kinds of volumes signaled that Washington was intending to be a, a different kind of um, farmer. Um, Washington continued to cultivate tobacco, um, which had always been the most important source of wealth for large um, Virginia state owners. Um, but he had returned from service alongside British officers and interactions with British officials um, uh, during the, the Seven Years' War. And he comes back with an enormous skepticism about the supposed benefits of, of um, empire. And those same, that same skepticism is soon uh, reflected in his correspondence with his tobacco merchants. And he um, is con increasingly convinced that Virginia planters can never win in, in the tobacco trade as it's structured by the 1760s. 
Um, and he found nothing but disappointment, basically, as a tobacco farmer, and very quickly um, starts to decrease the amount of tobacco that he's growing. Just within two or three years, um, he um, is planting less. And then finally, in, in not finally, just in uh, four or five years um, after he starts as a tobacco planter, in the midst of the Stamp Act crisis that he thought was going to completely um, redefine um, trade uh, between Great Britain and um, the American colonies, he decides to abandon tobacco altogether um, at, at his uh, Mount Vernon estate. And so um, by 1765, the, the tobacco planter decides to become a wheat farmer. Um, he takes advantage of the growing demand for, for wheat, um, American wheat in emerging markets in Southern Europe and the Caribbean that are not um, uh, regulated by the uh, kind of navigation acts that so uh, closely restricted the tobacco trade. And again, he turns um, to um, his tobacco merchants, ironically, to enable this change. This is um, a trade card from one of the uh, seed firms that um, Washington's merchants um, purchase seeds uh, for new crops, new grasses that he's um, introducing at, at Mount Vernon. Um, and so that there's a whole material culture. He also orders his um, new millstone um, uh, uh, through his London um, merchants that is um, capable of producing what was soon recognized as the most the highest quality of flour uh, in, in Virginia. The, the transition from, from tobacco um, uh, to wheat significantly changed the work of, of the enslaved laborers at, at Mount Vernon, but um, it did not, as has sometimes been assumed, lessen Washington's demand uh, for their labor. Wheat required far more land under um, cultivation than tobacco did, and the enslaved laborers at Mount Vernon then began to um, create new fields for a new kind of rotation system of corn, tobacco, of corn, wheat, and a year of fallow. By 1774, he has a really kind of staggering 1,000 acres planted in wheat. It's more than he ever does again, but, um, but he's cleared 1,000 acres for the purpose or, um, of, of growing uh, wheat when he would have only had a couple of hundred um, at most for, for tobacco. Um, and with, with the access to the money and um, uh, the connections that came with his marriage to uh, Martha Custis, um, he had dramatically increased his purchase of enslaved laborers. He, he purchased an additional um, more than 60 um, enslaved persons in the 15 years preceding the Revolutionary War. In his first year of marriage, he, he um, purchases more enslaved laborers than he had um, uh, purchased in all of his life before that. Um, and so um, he also gains the labor of, of a number of um, laborers that are brought from the Custis estates in lower um, tidewater, and, and they join um, the much smaller number that Washington had already enslaved in Mount Vernon. Um, so that the, by the eve of the revolution, Washington controls um, 120 enslaved adults at his estate, and he found work um, for them, not just in the fields, but also um, in the crafts required of milling, um, of weaving. As he diversifies the manufacturers on the estate, um, he finds um, new ways of exploiting enslaved labor, um, the construction of new farm structures that are needed for, um, for wheat. And for the first time, he places enslaved um, men as overseers on three of his individual plantations. And he replaced um, the, the costly hire of, of, of white men who, were, uh, who cradled wheat, who cut, did the first cut of wheat at the harvest. He successfully replaces them with um, young enslaved men who are, are trained um, to the task. But Washington's most ambitious innovations in farming and um, come after the Revolutionary War. And um, it was just after the Revolutionary War when he um, re returns, supposedly retires to Mount Vernon, that he announced that he, he wanted to become, um, a, wanted to adopt what he called the complete course <clears throat> of husbandry as practiced in the best farming counties of England. Um, and it was not just British uh, cultivation methods that now interested him, but rather a whole complicated system of crop rotations, 
coordinated with livestock management. This is a system that leads him to redesign um, the entire agricultural landscape um, at Mount Vernon, extending over several thousand acres, and also to demand that the enslaved um, undertake a massive work to create uh, fields for rotations that extended over seven years, and to construct what were probably the largest barns in the United States at the time, barns that were based on sophisticated British de designs and made of bricks manufactured by the enslaved on, on the estate. Washington hires um, an experienced English farmer who um, uh, left Gloucestershire to um, go to Virginia and advise uh, Washington at his Virginia estate. And he again turns to books. The most important at, at this time is, is um, Henry Holmes, Lord Kames, um, uh, The Gentleman Farmer. Uh, this had been published in the early years of the revolution. By the time the revolution is over, it's become one of the most important books um, in Great Britain for guiding uh, agricultural improvement. Washington um, gets this volume and he copies out over, as was his habit with agricultural treatises, he copies over 100 pages of notes about cultivation methods. He traces um, new implements, um, harrows and plows that he's um, going to use. Um, but when this time around, not just books, but he actually starts interacting with British agriculturalists. And when people in Great Britain learned of Washington's interest, it was a very powerful uh, uh, symbol that, that, as Arthur Young said, he's glad to learn that the general has become a farmer. And people like Young reach out to Washington um, and they offer um, their assistance. Uh, Young, of course, is by then the most um, influential agricultural writer um, in Great Britain. Washington already would have known about, he um, had been exposed to some of, of Young's um, writings, had one, one title, I think, in his, um, in his library by even before he heard from, but out of the blue, he gets this letter from Arthur Young, who um, hears he's looking for a farmer. And Young offers all kinds of assistance. He offers to send seeds, to send plows, to send any uh, workmen that, that might be of, of use, and also, of course, advice. And he sends Washington what were the first volumes of the Annals of Agriculture um, to be received by anyone in, um, in America. Um, Washington is also approached by Sir John Sinclair, um, who um, is the founding president of the Board of Agriculture. And Sinclair becomes one of the most important um, agricultural correspondents of, of Washington's, I think ultimately more important than, than Arthur Young. And the correspondence with um, Sinclair does talk about practical farming to some extent, but um, with, with um, Washington and Sinclair are talking more broadly about the political economy of agriculture and especially governmental support of agricultural improvement. Washington becomes um, an early convert into believing that the U United States government needs to support agriculture in um, some um, organized way in the same way that the um, Board of Agriculture had done. Um, and both of these gentlemen, um, and by this, um, at, at some point in their correspondence, Young uh, becomes the secretary of the Board of, of, of Agriculture. Um, and both Young and Sinclair were very concerned about the impact of the loss of the American um, uh, colonies. And, and they found in Washington um, a great encouragement um, for what they hoped would be new and beneficial exchanges between the United States and, and Great Britain. And Washington found in them um, uh, kinds of, of kindred spirits with whom he was far more candid about the deficiencies of American farming than he ever was with any of his American um, correspondents. They really become his most important um, confidants, um, joined also by James Anderson, the Enlightenment figure from Edinburgh, who he meets um, and, and, exchange, and, and is involved with both exchange of plant material and, and books. Um, but perhaps even more surprising than Washington's pursuit of, of methods of British agriculture improvement immediately after securing American independence was his um, decision to expend an enormous amount of effort to adapt enslaved labor um, to a very complicated and inherently experimental system of farming. Um, it was a type and a type of farming that, that really nowhere else was so closely associated um, with enslaved labor as it would be at, at, Mount, at Mount Vernon. During the Revolutionary War, Washington, writing to his farm manager, um, had 
expressed just a, a, a general um, uh, desire to um, be done with um, managing enslaved labor. Um, and um, he also at several points during uh, the mid 1780s, he privately endorsed the, the principle of gradual abolition. Um, and so many biographers, I think most biographers, have assumed that somehow Washington after the Revolutionary War was eager to move away from a reliance on enslaved labor, that he somehow saw um, slavery as, as diminishing in, um, or receding in importance as, as a labor system. Um, and I found that it was anything but that. Um, that as Washington implemented the new system of farming beginning in 1785, he took any number of decisive steps um, to rely more exclusively on enslaved laborers um, and, and to find new value in, in the growing number of enslaved laborers um, whom he, he controlled. He, he placed even more enslaved overseers in charge of four of the five farms devoted to commercial farming. He made um, more concerted efforts to replace hired white artisans with enslaved workers, um, such as the carpenters who um, made the agricultural implements and the bricklayers who um, worked with the carpenters in the construction of the massive barns. He also um, is investing in a long-term specialization of labor. He increases the specialization of labor by gender um, with uh, women field workers taking on a much larger share of, of plowing and uh, working with the draft animals <clears throat> while the enslaved men were disproportionately um, uh, working in artisan trade in supporting of, of this diversified farming. The British agricultural books that Washington um, read, obviously they had really not, no advice for him on how to manage enslaved labor or to adapt, adapt it to um, uh, this kind of husbandry. In fact, they had very little to say about uh, labor, most of the ones he read. Um, but as, as he initiated his extensive reorganization of farms, he devised a highly original system um, for supervising and accounting for the weekly tasks of every single enslaved laborer on, on the farms. This might be a little hard to, to see, but I just wanted to show you this. He develops this um, format for weekly reports that are submitted by overseers, um, enslaved and free, on each of his um, separate farms. Mount Vernon at that point is divided into four or five uh, farms at a time. And the overseers would provide an, an account of what every single enslaved laborer and only the enslaved laborers um, carried out, the tasks they carried out that week. Um, and these, um, the detail of these allows Washington to supervise um, labor more closely and to account for uh, uh, the time spent by laborers more closely than ever before, whether he's in residence or not. And he relies on these very heavily during the eight years that he's president and living in um, New York and for most of the time in, in Philadelphia. What's particularly interesting is that um, by, um, by the time he leaves for the presidency in um, 1789, He's, he's um, standardized the format of these so that they're in um, uh, the format of double entry bookkeeping, um, uh, something that Washington's very familiar with and really adept at. He's a master um, uh, keeper of, of, of the books, of the ledgers. Um, but he keeps these in the format of double entry um, bookkeeping, but they have nothing to do with money. It's not about measuring productivity. It's not about an exchange of any kind of money. Um, rather, each farm is debited for the number of, of um, enslaved people working and then times the number of the days, six days of the week. And then below is they're credited for the days um, that are spent on the various tasks. Um, so it, it becomes almost a, a, a manifestation of Washington's idea that, that, he, that he, he has some kind of transactional um, relationship with the enslaved, that it's a, it's a document, what he thinks they owe him once he has provided um, for their provisions and, and basic working, um, uh, basic um, sustenance. Um, they, these are great for tracing uh, the impact of the agricultural um, uh, uh, changes on, on the lives and the work of the, of the enslaved. Um, and they, they stretch throughout the whole period. Uh, about a third of them uh, survive uh, from, from the time they were developed in 1785 until the end, end of Washington's um, life. Um, they're also typical of the kind of almost obsessive attention to detail. Washington keeps every kind of account or record of um, provisions distributed, that um, a store account that one could imagine. Um, 
And this um, almost obsessive attention to detail and, and control um, is, is very helpful for writing a book like this, but it also, it's very important that it never obscures um, a much grander and, and I think aspirational vision that Washington brought to this new kind of farming. What was really driving uh, this pursuit of, of um, the British course of farming, particularly after 1785. This is the uh, symbol of uh, the uh, seal of the Philadelphia Society for Improving Agriculture. It was established almost exactly at the same time that Washington um, decides to um, hire an English farmer and to begin this new course of farming. He, he is an honorary member. Um, the society is a very important um, uh, correspondent uh, society for, for Washington. Uh, they also um, shared the exact same ideals about English farming and criticism of, of American farming that he did. Um, but um, it obviously had a new vision of, 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 a, of a new world order that they, they hoped um, they, they could um, um, promote from, from Philadelphia and on their private estates. Um, but almost none of them were um, slave owners. One of the most famous members who was almost immediately starts uh, moving toward um, freeing, the, freeing the enslaved. Um, but Washington, like many of, of his British correspondents and like these kinds of like-minded associates in American improvement societies, um, they, he saw in, in this free exchange of agricultural knowledge um, what Washington called the liberal communication of experiment, um, the potential for the development of each nation's individual reciprocal advantages, which would then serve as the basis of, of free trade. And Washington becomes probably, the, the, uh, for many advocates of improvement on both sides of the Atlantic, the preeminent um, example of, of, of support for what some in the United States and Great Britain called um, the art of peace, that this improved agriculture would be the fundamental art of, of peace. Um, and over the next 15 years, um, Washington participates in a really global network of scientific and agricultural exchange that extends throughout the British Empire and also the reach of American um, diplomats. Um, his first improvement project following the Revolutionary War was breeding mules. And he um, he starts by, he's searching for a Spanish jackass. And he'd um, been told by the Spanish minister to the uh, United States during the Revolutionary War um, that uh, the Spanish jackasses were the best for um, breeding mules. He then had read about the advantages of, of, of mules. And he determines to do this <clears throat> um, in 1784. And he sends out feelers through um, to merchants and also through diplomats. Would it be possible to get one of these animals normally prohibited from export. And what sets in motion this, this whole network of diplomats um, and, and merchants in Europe, both American and, and, and Europeans, uh, to see if they can locate one of these animals for uh, Washington. Uh, King Charles III of Spain finds out about Washington's interests and he immediately orders two of the best specimens to be sent to Washington as a gift. Only one of them survived the journey. Washington named him Royal Gift, and here he is. He was um, memorialized in a farmer's almanac in, um, uh, published in Massachusetts. The animal arrived in, in Massachusetts because the trade route from Bilbao was to, um, to Boston area. And um, the, the travel from Boston down to, to Mount Vernon is covered in the newspapers. Uh, and as I said, the almanac got this, tributes are written to him. And people um, from uh, interested in, in improvement throughout the United States, people like John Jay in New York, uh, leading uh, planters in, in South Carolina, all approach Washington wanting to breed mares with um, uh, either a royal gift or with uh, a subsequent jackass that Washington receives through Lafayette's um, efforts uh, that comes from, from Malta. Um, but the real interest here is that Washington learns just how many people are interested in what he's doing and how much support that will offer him and also the fame that he's gaining as, as an improvement advocate. And so Washington receives um, gifts of agricultural items and, and plant materials really from, from all, originally derived from all over the world. He has wheat that um, it, he experiments with that comes from as far as the Cape Colony of Southern Africa and from the Barbary Coast and, and even from Russia. And the Russia example is just a wonderful uh, sense of the chain of these um, uh, improvement networks of 
Catherine the Great gave a sample of wheat to George III, who gave it to a common farmer who lived near um, Kew, who um, then gave it to Arthur Young, and Arthur Young then sends it to um, to Washington. So they come with a kind of lineage that um, that that Washington is very aware that he's what he's engaging in is part of a of a of a much broader network. He gets breeding stock from the West Indies and Europe. He gets new designs of of plows and machines for threshing wheat, and he also gets a steady stream of of agricultural books from from Great Britain. Um, by this time, Washington um, was celebrated in as soon as he really as soon as he retires from the Continental Army, celebrated in Europe and the United States as as the American Cincinnatus, and recalling the, the the leader of ancient Rome who was called from the plow to defend the Republic in battle, and then rejects an offer of arbitrary power to go back to the plow at his farm. And in the 18th century, the, the image of Cincinnatus at the plow um, was seen as a model of, of public virtue. And the real life association of, of Washington with his own plow became a, a powerful symbol of his patriotic um, virtue and brings even more attention to um, his farming innovations. This is the, the Houdon standing statue of Washington that was commissioned for um, the state capitol in, in Richmond. It was commissioned to be Washington as Cincinnatus. Um, Houdon, the, the famous French sculptor, um, in consultation with Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, and actually with some input from Washington, decides to present him as the new Cincinnati, as a modern Cincinnatus, not in um, anti ancient dress the way people might have expected. And he presents Washington um, with the plow at his side, um, but it's not the plow that is normally associated with Cincinnatus. This is a drill plow. This is a drill plow, much like the one that Washington um, designed and that would have been manufactured by the enslaved carpenters and blacksmiths um, at, at Mount Vernon. Um, but th this image of Cincinnatus, which was so widespread, um, it gives you some indication of Washington was in effect farming on a public stage. Um, and his uh, literally becomes a stage because he starts receiving hundreds of visitors who pilgrimage to Mount Vernon to meet the, the hero of, of the revolution. And he saw that as an opportunity to display his agricultural innovation. It's what he was most interested in. A, 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 um, um, a Polish nobleman came uh, late in Washington's life and, and uh, reported that Washington politely answered all of my questions about the revolution, but his greatest interest is farming. And, and it's really what he saw these visitors as being able to expose him to, to new kinds of, of farming. Um, this is um, what's often called the Five Farms Map. It was just, um, based on a survey that Washington did in 1793, but it shows how he completely transformed um, the estate, especially the four farms uh, dedicated to commercial agriculture, dividing each of them into um, seven fields, but also gathering at their center, um, drawing these, these vistas that could be seen from the roads, the public roads that intersected the estate, leading down to um, the barns um, and the, the improved agricultural buildings that he, um, that he would display. And Washington encouraged visitors to go with him on his circuit of, of the farms that he did almost every day. Um, and everyone who visits, who comments about it, recognizes that this is, this is a landscape, an agricultural landscape, unlike anything else in America. And particularly unlike anything else in Virginia, which is famous for its unkempt and, and uh, ill, Ill um, manicured um, estates. A vis the visitor from Poland said he couldn't believe that Washington hadn't been to Europe because he understood the aesthetics of agricultural um, landscape design so well. A, a British visitor um, compared the, the vistas and, and views that were created to the working farms to those of Capability Brown. Washington became particularly obsessed um, um, with um, British style hedgerows, what he called live fences, um, and even goes so far as to, to tell his managers that if even if it requires diverting enslaved laborers from profit making enterprises like the fishery, it was more important to get these um, hedgerows established. And he explains to the manager that the, the hedges are meant to be ornamental to the farm and reputable to the farmer. And it's this focus on um, a certain aesthetic design and also cultivating this 
his own reputation as knowledgeable about um, the best um, kinds of improved um, farming. But of course, the visitors who came to Mount Vernon in these years also observed the work of the enslaved who made possible Washington's ambitious improvements. This is the only contemporaneous view of Mount Vernon that includes a residence of the enslaved. Um, is that, is that work? That, I don't know the pointer there. That's what was known as the house um, uh, for families that had been there for quite a while. We can date this um, image to the early 1790s because that um, building is, is raised. And then this is the new, um, building, which is dormitories and, and a greenhouse, which has been reconstructed at Mount Vernon, but where the enslaved live. Um, but it, anywhere that I went, went to visit it, at the estate in, in came to Mount Vernon, saw um, uh, the enslaved um, who were so essential to these agricultural improvements. And, and just as agriculturalists um, on both sides of the Atlantic understood the powerful symbol of the military leader turned innovative farmer, so anti-slavery advocates were convinced um, that Washington's support for their cause and his emancipation of the enslaved under his control would promote wider support for ending slavery in the new United States. And, um, Support for abolition of slavery, they argued, often in direct communication with Washington, they argued would be the, the final burnish on Washington's uh, reputation and it would fulfill his um, uh, role as, as the champion of liberty. The earliest documented appeal um, uh, for Washington to uh, support some um, measures toward abolition um, came from Lafayette who even before Washington resigns his commission from the Continental Army, invited Washington to join him in an experiment, which they appear to have talked about earlier, an experiment to educate enslaved laborers to um, be free and self-sufficient tenants. Washington receives, receives personal appeals from religious leaders like the Methodist clergy um, who come to Mount Vernon and ask for his uh, support of a petition uh, to enact gradual abolition in um, Virginia or the Quakers who um, asked for his support for petitions to Congress that would have regulated this, um, the foreign slave trade. The French abolitionist um, Jacques-Pierre Brousseau uh, went to Mount Vernon um, and he urged Washington to lead an abolitionist, to establish and lead an abolitionist society. And he argued that it, um, it would be fitting if the man he called uh, the savior of America would also be the man who brought freedom to hundreds of thousands of um, blacks held in bondage in the United States. And these appeals to Washington, um, including many in the press, um, which were not as polite or deferential, or many of which were far more critical of Washington's continued um, enslavement of laborers. Um, these continue until the end of Washington's life. And Washington is the unique object of these appeals, far more than any of the other um, uh, enslaving founders. Um, we tend to think of Jefferson is the great hypocrite because he was the author of the language of the Declaration of Independence. But at the time, Washington was seen as, as um, the principal object of these abolitionist appeal and the person who could um, um, promote this, this uh, movement toward a more um, widespread gradual abolition in the United States. Um, but a, apart from a very few private comments in support of the principle of gradual abolition, um, the only change in Washington's attitude towards slavery is, is evident in his management of agricultural labor. And, and in the years after he first heard um, the appeals of abolitionists, he makes some effort to um, shield the enslaved at Mount Vernon from what he perceived to be the most inhumane and brutal aspects of, of slavery. He resolved to end um, the sale or purchase of enslaved laborers. Um, he resolved to keep families together. He insisted that the enslaved families receive adequate food and medical care. He discourages the violent punishment of, of laborers who had failed to meet the demands for work. All of those um, resolutions, I might say, were frequently compromised by Washington or frequently um, uh, violated by Washington or his managers. Um, but, it, and, but in return for these limited protections, Washington imposed far greater demands um, on the enslaved laborers to work, as he described it, from sunup to sundown, six days a week, 
throughout the year in and in what he increasingly defined as as their duty. And it's there that those work reports I showed you define this sense of that he believes there's a sort of transactional um, relationship that he provides uh, the basic uh, provisions to um, um, live and protect and to protect family. And in return, he demands even more of their labor. And the laborers are working far more throughout the year. There is no there's no downtown town time in when you look through those work reports, you can see that um, Washington very effectively increases um, uh, the demands of work throughout um, the calendar year. Um, Washington never acknowledged similar efforts um, of what historians now call amelioration of, of slavery in the Caribbean or the, or the Chesapeake estates. But, but like Jefferson, with whom um, he almost certainly did discuss the challenge of managing enslaved labor in this new kind of agriculture, he seemed to believe that he could somehow, in the words of Jefferson, make slavery more rational and humane. But there's no central turning point that one can point to or central argument that um, uh, turned Washington's mind. But over the course of his first term as, as president, Washington slowly and I think haltingly confronted evidence that, that slavery um, and his vision of enlightened farming were incompatible, maybe even antithetical to one another. For one thing, he repeatedly hired um, uh, British-born managers and artisans, hoping to draw on their knowledge and their experience on British farmers. And again and again, almost, well, in every single case, um, he comes to the conclusion that these um, experienced and very capable um, British farm managers or British artisans were incapable of managing enslaved labor in the way that he did or in the way he expected um, uh, the white supervisors under him to do. Um, uh, he ends up, um, the Gloucestershire farmer, James Bloxon, was fired because in the words of Washington, he had no capacity um, for management of the enslaved. An overseer um, at the mansion house was um, dismissed for no other reason than is unfamiliar with, with managing uh, enslaved laborers that were, as Washington said, prone to what he labeled idleness. Um, and also in his travels as president, when he takes a tour, he visits every state in the new United States. Um, and he, he um, gains a greater awareness of the ways in which slavery differentiated grain farming in Virginia and Maryland uh, from the same kind of farming in the, in the middle Atlantic states. And it's in P Pennsylvania in particular, where he's a you know, resident for seven years, where he frequently visits um, uh, the uh, states of, of his friends in the Philadelphia Society for Improving Agriculture, um, that he, he observes what he finally acknowledges are the superior agricultural improvements to those in, in Maryland or Virginia. Um, and ultimately, um, he attributes those, the superiority of those improvements to the state's um, law um, mandating the gradual abolition of slavery. And by the close of his presidency, he admitted to a British correspondent, Sinclair, uh, tellingly never to an American, but he admitted to Sinclair that Virginia would need to do the same or would risk being left behind by these states to the north. And on a more personal level, Washington tried to keep managing the farms at, at Mount Vernon while he was in New York and then Philadelphia, probably an impossible task with any um, system of labor. Um, but it was during that time that he expressed um, really an, an enormous frustration and, and an un, unprecedented impatience and anger, at least in terms of what, what is documented in his correspondence, an impatience and anger with um, the enslaved laborers, whom he regularly accused of, of theft and a neglect of work. Um, he feared that, that control of, of the enslaved laborers at his estate had broken down in his absence. And by the close of his presidency, he also conceded that his limited attempts to manage enslaved labor um, in an ostensibly more humane uh, way had failed to secure the orderly work that he demanded. Um, he finally writes in the closing months of his presidency, he writes, um, a new manager at, at Mount Vernon had admitted that he took um, part in the corrections, meaning uh, the euphemism for the floggings of, of enslaved laborers. Um, if, and Washington writes back and said, I agree that if they do not do what you ask them to do, they must be forced to. And, and that's a major change from what Washington had been saying for that he at least kept this fiction, even he was, even though he was ordering people to be uh, brutally uh, punished, he somehow thought that in terms of work, he could um, uh, provide other kinds of incentives or a closer supervision. He believes that a close, and by the end of his presidency, he acknowledged that 
he can't do he can't do that. Um, but by that time, Washington had certainly recognized that Virginia planters, uh, as he had told Brousseau in 1788, um, Virginia planters were not going to endorse any legislation for gradual abolition. It just wasn't going to happen um, in um, Virginia in the way it had in Pennsylvania. And by that time, he had, he had determined to find his own way to emancipate the enslaved under his control. And the book um, describes, I think for the first time, a very complicated plan um, to lease his farms to experienced British farmers who he thought would provide him with the income that would allow him to free the enslaved that he controlled, um, and who also might then hire uh, the freed laborers or set them up as tenants. Washington's never specific about it. There are hints of, of one way or the other, but clearly he thought this plan to lease to these, um, uh, and he was looking for very experienced, highly capitalized um, British tenants to take over these farms, to continue the experiments and innovations he had implemented, um, but also to give him the income that he would be able to um, free the slave. And in fact, this this map, which is is so famous, but seldom recognized that this was created as, as kind of a, an advertisement to attract um, the, the British farmers who would come and lease these farms. In the original version, which does not show up well, it's in, in Washington's hand, it then lists um, a description of each of the farms and the acreage of what's grown there. The, and it's in, meant to entice um, the um, English farmers or Brit and Scottish farmers that he, he was looking for. Um, and despite the um, very active assistance of several influential friends in Great Britain who tried to recruit um, farmers for Washington. He never found um, the farmers who would carry on his improvements. And he privately declared, especially to his British correspondents, that he would never turn his farms over to what he called the slovenly farmers of the United States. Um, but when the plan comes to naught, which when he retires from the presidency and has the last interview with a potential um, English farmer, um, he decides in the meantime to hire out um, as many of the enslaved under his control as he could. And he searched for ways to employ the remaining enslaved laborers at Mount Vernon. And in the last few months of his life, um, his unexpected death, um, he's planning to um, relocate um, a, a significant number of enslaved laborers from Mount Vernon to um, lands in the West to remove tenants from land there or to open up new lands that he owned and to employ uh, the enslaved laborers from Mount, Mount Vernon there. Um, at the same time, in the, in the summer of 1799, five months before his death, um, Washington drafted the will that um, eventually would provide for, for the freedom of more than 120 enslaved people. Um, and, and in that provisions of that will, he ensured that once freed, um, the elderly and the infirm among the enslaved would be cared for throughout the remainder of their lives, and that the young would be educated to support themselves. But in that will, he offers, and in no other letter uh, or document, he offers no principled words uh, condemning slavery. Um, he still believed that his, his actions and example were sufficient explanation. Um, and as he had anticipated, his example had almost no effect in, in Virginia, um, or at least on other enslavers in Virginia. Um, and his emancipation, I think, would be strangely minimized um, in the historical memory of Washington, um, especially in, in the 19th century. Just to close, um, several years after um, he resumed his life as a full-time farmer following the Revolutionary War, Washington wrote that the life of a husbandman, husbandman was the most delectable of all. And he said in, in language that's unusually poetic for Washington, it just doesn't read like Washington, but he wrote that to see plants rise from the earth and flourish by the superior skill and bounty of the labor fills a contemplative mind with ideas which are more easy to be conceived than expressed. And this, this was the life under vine and fig tree in the world in which people learned war no more. Scriptural phrases that Washington writes over 30 times in the months leading up to his um, resignation from the Continental Army and his anticipated return to Mount, Mount Vernon. Um, it, it's this almost Georgic vision um, of, of um, the books that he had read from, from Great Britain. And anyone who, who approached the mansion house um, during these years um, would have seen um, this 
Dove of Peace, which was the vein at the top of the cupola over Mount Vernon. This is designed by Washington to be the symbol of his house, to see what people see as, as they approach the mansion house. As they go into the uh, most public room at Mount Vernon, um, uh, they would have seen these um, stucco designs of um, farming implements. These are um, designed by a, an accomplished stucco artist that Washington brought, but they are Washington's Washington prescribed the designs. The ceiling is filled with other implements um, associated with um, th this idea of this of this natural bounty of, of the rural landscape and a dignity of, of labor. And it's, it's an ideal that attracted him to British writing on agricultural improvement as a young planter, and it guided his dramatic reorganization of every aspect of farming following independence. And, his engagement with um, a community of enlightened agricultural leaders, this, this, this continued co uh, correspondence with people like Sinclair and, and um, Young, um, deepened Washington's conviction that, that the example of farming that he pursued would, would enable um, the new nation to prosper through agricultural trade and peaceful commerce, and also that his model of the stewardship of, of the land would ensure um, political stability. But that ideal of, of rural life and of agricultural bounty would always remain in conflict with a system of labor that rested on violence and a denial of individual labor. In this book, I've, I've tried to recover a, a neglected and I think essential element of Washington's life. I've also tried to show how a pursuit of, of a particular model of agricultural improvement ultimately and uniquely to Washington convinced him that, that slavery had no place in an enlightened or commercially prosperous republic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruce. We, we're just going to, before, yeah, we're going to just show you these two, before we turn to the questions, just a little bit of marketing on our behalf. Here's our next, uh, you can see Rethinking the Numbers Game on the 17th of March, and then on the 24th of March, uh, Criminal Assistance, Understanding Crimes of sol Solidarity. So these are, uh, Shifting, um, in particular, some of you will remember Dr. Philippa Rivero de Silva, who is a senior research fellow here at the uh, at the institute. And so it's a very much a return, and some of you may, well, I'm sure, be uh, looking forward to meeting her again. So that would be uh, that would be great. Uh, and then, as I say, Lu Lucy Mayblin uh, on the 24th of March. So that's what we have in store for you. Please, please. Um, sign up or better still come and join us here in person. So uh, that's what we have in store for you. Um, so shall we now turn to the questions? Nick, are you? Um, no, no, he's not. Uh, Nick is. I'll do the screen later. Yes, so Nick, we're going to close this down and then turn to questions. Shall we start with questions from the from the floor? Um, uh, it's a bit like the, the Muppet show here. Um, uh, so how do we do this, Nick? Do we, should we not both just be on the screen no, at the same no. time? It'd be better if I'm over here. No, no, you, you can do you, it, John. You should be there, Nick. Uh, um, Trevor, if you'd like to start. Yes, that's fantastic. Just one, one thing I'm wondering about. You, you talk a great deal about an improving farm. Um, one difference between the improving farmers in the Americas and improving farmers here is, of course, that they've got capital assets in the form of enslaved labor. Um, in, the, in 1759, of course, when he gets Custis's slaves, and it'd be interesting to compare Custis uh, with Washington as farmers, because I've always got the impression, actually, that the, the previous generation were better farmers, or at least more successful farmers in terms of money than, than um, perhaps some of the revolutionary ones were. People like Jefferson and Madison, and particularly Monroe, will end up greatly in debt. They're not. Uh, but does, does, does Washington calculate in terms of how much money he's making by improving his human capital? Because uh, certainly in other places like Jamaica and other parts, right. they do that by such things as uh, training up men to be trade people, um, looking at the, the, the most likely enslaved people and giving them skills and various things like that. Does it, does he he's certainly improve, making an improving land with a farmer in that way. He's certainly making those choices, and he's very consciously making those choices. He never calculates 
The cost of labor, I mean, he, he's trying to get rid of hired labor. Well, why doesn't he do that? I don't, you know, it's in part because I think he's, well, I think throughout all this, he's driven as much by cultural goals as he is by, by bottom line economic. And he really wants to be, it's a kind of mastery that he's interested in exercising. And Washington also wants to, he does want to save money on labor, particularly um, uh, with artisans and, and any hired uh, white laborers. But he doesn't specifically calculate. I mean, you probably know that when they put, Washington and Jefferson are involved in putting together a, a famous survey at the request of Arthur Young. And Jefferson, and Young is totally mystified because they're not calculating the costs of labor in any way that's familiar to him. And Jefferson said he had never thought to calculate the, the cost of enslaved labor. And then he tries to do it then and there, and he comes up with the conclusion that the enslaved labor is, is less expensive than, than the hired labor. Um, it's hard to believe, doesn't it? Pardon? It's hard to believe that he, if you have a very expensive. That he hadn't ever calculated, you yeah, mean? Yeah, if you have something, something that's very expensive, you're not sort of thinking, well, if I, if I had to, I would sell these enslaved people yep. for this amount. Well, he come, but he comes up with the conclusion that the enslaved lab, labor is less expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Washington never makes that kind of, of financial calculation in regard, to, but you're absolutely right that he is making the calculation that he's just trying to rely more. And, and in some ways, it's a continuous process from the 1760s on that he's trying to find ways to rely on enslaved labor for more um, skilled labor, labor that he usually re has relied on hired um, white people for. And it's cradling that's the most obvious because there, he, well, there he does calculate how much he's paying. And uh, cradlers are paid quite a bit of money. And um, there's one season where he said, I, at the end of the harvest, I can't make any money if I'm hiring cradlers and spending this kind of money. And immediately he hires a white cradler um, to train enslaved men to cradle. And um, yeah, and he does that later, that even, well, really even from them, but much more after the Revolutionary War, it's often part of an article of, an article of agreement in hiring a, um, uh, a white artisan was that they would um, also not only do the work uh, that they're hired for, but that they would also um, train a, as apprentices, basically any um, young enslaved men that Washington assigned to, to them. And that becomes standard in any carpenter, bricklayer, ditcher um, that he's hiring. That he, he doesn't want them to just do the work. He wants to train um, more enslaved men so he doesn't have to hire them in the future. In the English uh, 18th century, you know, in English marks, we're very much moving towards hired labour away from, um, you know, sort of the yearly servants or whatever. And this has always been accredited to the agricultural revolution in England and mm. that they moved to hired labour. Um, but I wondered, um, I made this. I don't think you said how, what proportion of labor he had that was hired versus enslaved, or was it, or was it all enslaved that mostly did the work? Um, the agricultural labor is almost entirely enslaved labor. The ag any, any field work, most processing of crops would be almost entirely enslaved labor. Washington is never successful in um, dispensing with hiring white tradesmen. It's actually, there is someone who's written a dissertation on this. I think it's, um, it's, it's a great, unexplored topic of, of, of Washington's inability to uh, dispense with uh, hired labor of all different kinds throughout his whole life because he certainly tries to. But in terms of actual field labor, only very early in his life, he occasionally hires um, people to help with the threshing, but, um, but not with the actual field work, except as I said, cradlers, and he's done away with that by before the Revolutionary War. So he's very successful in that sense in, in um, cultivating an a enslaved labor force that can carry out all that farm labor. Yeah, I was just saying, if you would then move on to. Yeah, it's just that, I mean, given that, it's, um, it's surprising that he read all these sort of treatises coming out of England uh, and applied the methods very much in terms of what he did, but didn't really pay any attention to the labor at all. But neither does those books. I've been through those books, and, and someone else has done even far more research on, on these kinds of, uh, in relation to Chesapeake labor. It's, it's shocking how they have almost nothing to say. If you looked at the 10 or 12 books that are most influential in Washington's um, guiding his agricultural changes, they don't talk about them. 
Arthur Young doesn't talk much about labor. I mean, it's a little more in the 19th century. I mean, as you get toward the end of the 18th century, but the books that Washington is relying on have, have very little to say. They'll talk about tenantry, but that's a different issue. Um, and, and, and that's Washington's not really paying attention to that. Um, one of the things I found interesting is I had, um, I had uh, done research in the agricultural improvements at Windsor, that were carried out by George III in the 1790s. And I was most struck by um, the methods of labor control that and supervision that they're being implemented are remarkably close and parallel to Washington's. One of my, my, my favorite example was, so Washington, when he starts keeping these work reports and um, you know, Mount Vernon Library of Congress, they always have called these farm reports. They're not, they're solely, they really should be called enslaved work reports um, because it's just monitoring them. But once he implements that, particularly as, as he's anticipating going away as president, um, he's insistent that every overseer receive a certain amount of paper and writing implements um, so that they will have um, uh, the ability to keep records throughout the week. They did the exact same thing um, when Nathaniel Kent takes over the improved farms at, at, at Windsor. Um, and they're talking about the same kinds of, of arrangement of, of the farmyards as much for supervision as they are for um, efficiency of feeding livestock or collecting manure. But, but yeah, there's, there's but it, it has always been sort of a frustration with me that I, what, how Washington, what questions would have even asked reading these books that said nothing about um, management of, of labor, which for him, he basically realizes it's the single most important challenge that he has. So. Mike, can I move you? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you. I've enjoyed that enormous catch. It's refreshing. We say change. Um, <laughs> Two, two questions you have left. So then, uh, you mentioned the, the seven uh, crop rotations, seven year crop rotation. Hey, we have heard of that in this country. I mean, we're, we're waiting to the four course rotations. Yeah. So where did that come Oh, no, no, there's plenty of sources for the seven. seven the... Yeah, I, I, I've seen that five, six, and seven, but as. No, Mark. Uh, it, it's hard to... it also, it gets some of that out of um, uh, um, Lord Kames, gentleman farmer. He copies charts out of that. Actually, the um, George III also did these kinds of charts like this. He had two systems, and he calls one Norfolk and one Flemish, later Gloucestershire, based on the number. It's totally based on the number of the rotations. Um, but is there any? I'm, it, I've got that in there. I'm just trying to think of the, it's home that I most closely associate that with. But um, and, and what's interesting is when Washington does this for the first several years, he's insistent on doing exactly what the British um, publications told him, with the one exception is he includes maize because it's um, essential for the provisioning of the enslaved. But otherwise, it takes him a while to decide maybe this isn't really how you should be farming in Virginia. And in 1793, he, he changes the rotations dramatically, relying almost exclusively on clover to restore the soil rather than every other. You know, he changes it every year as as one was supposed to. But, um, but uh, well, I may, yeah, yeah. Uh, he may not have been interested in labor politics, but labor is only one of the factors of production. What about land politics? Did you measure these were experiments after all? And experiments you normally expect to see an outcome that's improving on what we currently have, or at least changes from what we currently have. Did he never measure things like land politics? He's, he's focused on um, land. And, and restoring the, the fertility of the land more than anything else. It's what's driving these improvements. And it's why he's not making any money, basically. And he says that. He doesn't want to be focusing on, he tells his farmers not to focus on immediate profit, that my main focus is on the stewardship of the land and, and being able to come up with a rotation system that it that remains as productive and it's all measured by wheat. Um, it, he wants to keep the productivity of wheat um, at the highest level possible, but something that can be sustained over a number of years. And he is, they're very um, complicated calculations that are, um, they've never been published, 
but they're in the Washington papers at the Library of Congress. All he's president, he's, he's dra drafting these enormously complicated plans for the rotation, seven different versions. He's in back and forth with his manager who wants to sort of drive the cultivation of wheat more to, to increase profits. And Washington keeps saying, you know, you know my, my land will sink under it. So yes, he is he is measuring it in terms of wheat, wheat productivity. Um, but really only in, in that that's the outcome, even though six fields any given year are not in wheat. It's the wheat productivity that he's focusing on. Okay. okay. Mine's a follow-up question from what Trevor and Andrew had said. And since obviously Washington wedded improvement in agriculture, is there any evidence that he was concerned about improving the health and the maternity experience of the slave? Because clearly a healthy, happy workforce is going to be more productive. Was there anything at all that you found where he was focusing on um, that? Well, I did, but I mean, it's not, he's, he, he's not that focused on it, and um, he's always trying to balance the cost against the health. I mean, Virginia, Virginia is a much healthier climate than, than I mean, the, a lot of the amelioration improvement advocates in the, um, Caribbean are, are focused on that because of the enormous mortality rates, which are not as high in Virginia. Um, what Washington is concerned about is he's always make, wants to make sure the overseers are providing adequate medical care, but he's really ruthless in terms of, um, you know, if you wait, if it's a moment too late, calling the doctor is for nothing. And, you know, there's no idea of comfort. There's no idea of... of um, so would the doctors be the same people who were looking after Washington and the Sometimes they were. The, 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 the people who work as doctors are everything from uh, other enslaved people um, to free people in the community, both black and white, um, to sometimes it's Dr. Craig, the man who attended Washington on his um, death. Um, Craig is not, he was not regularly called, but he was, especially if it was someone who was there are, there are some instances of, of more extraordinary efforts being uh, expended for um, a favored servant or a promising young person. Um, there are several cases of that. Um, there's, there's one case where um, a, a man who's a, a domestic, an enslaved house servant, um, is bit by a dog and they, he can't have had rabies. As, what I know rabies was because this goes on for a year or more. He sends him to Pennsylvania to be treated by a doctor, but this is someone extremely important. This is not someone who's um, um, to, in Washington's life. Um, uh, he's someone that Washington would have valued. But there are also a couple of cases um, of, of young, there's a, there's a young man that um, called Bill who, um, it, there's an enormous amount of attention paid to him, but there are others that it's just, chilling to read what Washington says about um, uh, not not spending any more money than you have to. That, um, so he's not, it's not a concerted generalized effort to improve the, the health. It's a mixed picture. Yes, it is. So I think Nick, did you have a question? Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, there's a local folklore about Washington and one of his enslaved workers, Beverly, after um, ancestral connections to Beverly. I'm wondering now through hearing your discussion of him recruiting English farmers, whether that's that's the thing. So I think that's part one. And the second question uh, would be in Britain we're increasingly knowing uh, George the third as part of George. Um, was this uh, agricultural knowledge an increasing sign of kingship? And therefore did Washington aspire to this knowledge to show his credentials as king? I think. Well, not as king, but is, it, it, absolutely, I think it, um, agricultural improvement is a sign of, of responsible national leadership, very much so. Washington's very aware of that. Um, Frederick the Great fits into that just, just as, as easily, um, that it is a, a sense. It's not, um, Washington knows something about George III, but, uh, and his agricultural improvements, because Arthur Young tells him. Um, and uh, he certainly knows about the king's efforts at, at breeding, improving uh, sheep. Um, and he, he would have known about Frederick too, and all of them vice versa. I think the king knew far more about Washington than Washington knew about the king, but um, because he wanted 
followed it very closely, would have read in the Board of Agricultural Reports, um, which published some of Washington's letters. Um, but yes, and Washington, Jefferson talks like that to a certain degree as well. But Washington to me is, is just the pre preeminent example of someone who sees this as, as a responsibility of leadership. And th that's where the Cincinnati legend just reinforces that again and again, that this is somehow a manifestation of, of his um, civic virtue. Um, and I just wanted to ask what, if anything, does Washington actually say about slavery in his, his correspondence with these British agriculturalists, with the, the farmer advisors who he brings across, and with towards the end of his life, prospective tenants? Um, does he say anything about slavery? Does he assume that they know about slavery, that they make these sort of classical allusions to ancient Rome? So I just wonder about that. Um. It's a very good question and a very complicated question and answer, but I mean, basically, yes, um, uh, but it's often oblique. Um, he doesn't, you know, with, with all of these British correspondents who are helping him look for um, the tenant farmers, he doesn't ever explain that this is going to lead, but he, he only says that to one person, his private secretary is the only person. And he said, the real reason for this, for this plan, more powerful than all the others is that I intend to liberate a species of property, which I own repug hold repugnant to my spirit. Um, and I was talking about the silences he created. When he wrote that, he wrote it on a separate unsigned sheet of paper. And when he made the copy that he always did for his letter book that he knew would be the historical record, he omits it. So, I mean, that's the kind of, of care with which Washington, he obviously has to talk about slavery with Arthur Young um, when he does his um, survey of American agriculture. I think it's a turning point for Washington um, because he, he has to analyze the difference between and it comes out of the reports that he collects, the differences between wheat farming that he thinks is the same enterprise in New York, especially Pennsylvania and, and New Jersey, compared to Maryland and Virginia. And he does talk to um, uh, Young about the differences in labor and the impact of relying on enslaved laborers versus hired. Um, but it's not in any kind of um, broad summary of, of, of his, any opposition to slavery. Um, it's more just, ex he doesn't ignore it, but he is more explaining the particulars and the outcome of that. Um, but at, other than Washington has other core uh, communications that we know because he says, we'll talk about this when you get here. He says that to Lafayette. And then there's no recording of that conversation. Someone else might say, I was there when you and Lafayette said you want to get quit of Negroes but we have no record of Washington saying that. He was very, very careful. And then he never explains his emancipation, which I, you know, is just one of the hardest things. Um, if, if there hadn't been a letter from his neighbor, <clears throat> David Stort, and very close friend, with whom he apparently shared all the details of this, we wouldn't even know that the, the further details of this plan to lease the farms was indeed trying to lead toward, um, he, um, to emancipating the enslaved he owned. Okay, any more questions? Um, I'm an anonymous story, so uh, uh, excuse me if my uh, question is a bit naive. But um, five farms, a thousand acres uh, in total, you said. It, it, yeah. He had a thousand in wheat. The, the five yeah. farms were more than. substantial area, yeah. didn't he? And um, uh, who clears the, the forest? In the first instance, um, you're talking about the 18th century. Um, when, when is the forest cleared in order to provide for plantation or wheat or whatever? whatever? Uh, and um, assuming it's slaves, um, are they being brought from the south to uh, the northeast coast, or are they being uh, provided directly from? Africa to uh, the Northeast Seaboard? Um, the, the land at Mount Vernon would have first been cleared by Washington's father in the um, 1730s, um, and then the state grows from there. Um, Washington clears far more for farming than anybody else, and he moves. Um, by the time that map is made, there are 30, 
pond over 3,600 acres um, under cultivation, which is huge. The whole estate is 8,000. It's very, very, very large. And all of that for, for, for in implementing these plans would have been done by, by the enslaved laborers at, at Mount Vernon. In terms of, of Washington, um, his source of enslaved labor is, uh, are, are varied. He, um, he, he buys, often buys a, a few individuals, often from estates of someone who had died. Um, he occasionally is participating, and, and those are usually people who had pre already been enslaved in Virginia. He, um, on occasion, is buying um, enslaved people directly from Africa. There are, two, there are two places where I've been able to connect him to um, huge sales on the shore in Maryland, where 350 people had been brought from, from what's now Ghana. And he so he participates in the slave trade at, at almost every level of action that's available to someone in, in Virginia at, at, at that time. So he's certainly familiar with the slave trade at its most brutal and involving Africans, but the great majority of people um, that he um, would have purchased and enslaved had at least been already in, uh, um, in Virginia for a while, if not born there. Okay. Judith. Judith. No, no curious people want us over very hard to do that. Yeah, I just want to think he had the sort of Roman connection. I bet he read any of the sort of Latin trees to agriculture that were available at that time. I don't know whether they would have been translated. I don't know what was available in the the Um I I looked for that and no, I do not. But he certainly, you know, there's usually classical allusions in the beginning of all these books that he did read. And um, I, I don't, um, I've never seen any evidence of his direct engagement with any kind of um, Georgic verse from 18th century Virginia. Um, but he certainly had absorbed, and, and it, it comes through these books too. He's absorbed that language and that ideal. I mean, yeah, there are times he's writing, you think he has been reading Georgic first quite recently, but there's no there's no point at which I can identify. Washington is very, I, I think, he's always been underestimated by how much he learned from books, how dependent he was for books, and how uh, curious, uh, curious he was. Um, he is very practical and almost mercenary in his pursuit of knowledge. Um, he, um, he does read things that he seems to enjoy as literature, but in this regard, he's he's primarily interested in the most practical um, <coughs> lessons yeah. he can take. The, the only thing I, I, I was reading some of the papers, the elders, agricultural trees, and I forgot what he meant to go, but he's approached to um, enslaved labor, it's actually the same, so you review every year, you know, the right. ones that are not right. working very well, the ones that are sitting, right. and those are buying new ones, you know, so this, very, very pragmatic approach to the, the use of um, events like labor, although he did also have some hired labor as well that he used. But it, it just sort of felt when he was speaking earlier about that very yeah. pragmatic approach to it. Bruce, I'm just going to, um, before we close, just ask these are sort of question, reflections as much as questions, I suppose. Well, one of them is that when you're talking about abolition and Washington, whether you're kind of hinting there at a form of economic determinism in, in, in that this is publication of Pub Eric Williams. Of Eric Williams, I saw that yeah, this morning. Uh, I, was thinking. Yeah, I just wondered <coughs> whether, what your thoughts on that. The other one was really to do with, is this somebody who at a fundamental level either distrusts or ends up distrusting black capabilities and, and and particularly the capabilities of the enslaved. There's something, particularly in the, at the end there, we were talking about his absolute sort of anger and frustration. There's something, something very visceral going on there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sort of, absolute kind of these people, well, sorry, the, this idea of these people are never going to get this, um, which I think is kind of an interesting reminder of some of those, the, the, the kind of mental world in which people like Washington um, um, operate. I think you're absolutely right. But what's interesting is you don't start seeing that until the 1790s. No, 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 no. And, um, and, and it's a mix. Some, you know, it went, Jeff, when Jefferson did his calculation of capital investment in, in labor, 
he, um, for Arthur Young, he concludes by saying that this is my calculation that the, the enslaved labor is, is more profitable, but uh, it may have to be adjusted because he, um, he works with less intelligence. Yeah. Washington distances himself quite directly with that statement. He writes Young and he said, I think blacks are capable of excellent labor, but they have no incentive. We don't get, you know, and, he, and he's in some ways sympathetic. He said there is no concern for their reputation, which Washington always thinks is the most important driver of, of a work ethic. Um, but then there are other times when he, he even for a fairly minor task of, of taking care of, of, of sheep, he said there is not a, a single Negro among all mine. At that point, it's 300 people. He said there's not a single one that um, is capable of this task. I mean, there's this, these sweeping stations. All of those are written from Philadelphia when he's away. But there are these sweeping dismissals of, um, and there are others like that where he basically, and what I think really declines in the 1790s is that he um, becomes extremely suspicious. Um, and he's convinced that there's theft and all kinds of um, uh, goings on and um, uh, that it's undermining the order, order of work. Um, it's very, Striking that even after he makes that statement about wanting to liberate a certain species of property and clearly going to enormous lengths to try to devise this plan, as improbable as I think the plan is, um, that it it's after that that you find some of the most brutal remarks Washington makes and where he's much freer about talking about um, violent punishment in a way that he, he had not earlier. As to the abolitionists, I don't think it's a a William style calculation of, of efficiency that could be discerned by. Um, I think he's um, he's very I think he's very drawn to things like Brousseau, who talks about it more in just these general terms of of, of the enlightening um, of, um, uh, force of, of liberty. And and Washington clearly thinks there's there's a disjunction there, but it's not in terms of of calculating um, the. The actual it also creates a kind of disjunction between rhetoric and reality as time goes on. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, what I also find interesting is that Washington <clears throat> is very open to these appeals from abolitionists. Yeah. He never says he agrees with them or that he's going to do any of this. But um, in many cases, he, he obviously would have accepted somebody who came with an introduction from Lafayette, which is what Rousseau did. Um, but when Warner Mifflin uh, asks if he can come meet the president at the president's house, to um, uh, Washington readily agrees to it. He then tells him he can't say anything one way or another because he may have to make. I mean, that's classic Washington. Um, but he could have he could have kept the door closed. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so Washington's. His views, like on slavery and like abolition, is like one thing I realize is he's more subtle about like his approaches to like abolition. But is it because he's a Virginian and like Virginia is a slaveholding society? Because like most of the things that you mentioned, he talks about when he talks about slaveholding, it's usually outside of Virginia, right? Like Pennsylvania and stuff like that, right? So I was more curious about what you think about. Well, being in Virginia made a big difference. I mean, right. just a very small thing, but. Um, an enslaved man named Paul ran away several times from Union Farm and Washington wants to um, recapture him. Um, and as had happened with other people who escaped, the farm manager put an ad in the local newspaper and Washington said, I don't want anything like that published in any newspaper north of Virginia or north of Maryland. So he he it's he presents a very different self if it's going to be published in Philadelphia. This is this is late in his presidency, um, and he it's complicated for Washington because he's really quite alienated from Virginia for other reasons. He thinks Virginia farming is among the worst. He he really is alienated from the planter elite, the kind of political elite that he had known growing up and very closely tied to. He, his ties are to Philadelphia, both politically and agriculturally. And I think that also undermines his, I mean, at least to some awareness that He's differentiated by his reliance on enslaved labor, and he doesn't like that differentiation. Right. So.
Thank you. Uh, I think we've kept you long enough for us. Um, thank, <laughs> thank you again on behalf of everyone here for uh, a really, very exciting talk and a great, great discussion. So uh, thank you again. Thank you all.